Michael, how's lockdown been for you? Honestly, I haven't really been enjoying it because the whole virus thing has been making me feel down. And plus, I'm ac I've actually been concerned about Victoria. One of my best friends lives outside Melbourne. And um, I'm kind of concerned about New South Wales. Mm. Hoping that, that New South Wales won't be end up in the same fate. When we were in lockdown, did it put a little bit of a dampener on your dating life? Uh, kind of. But it did not really that make much of a difference because I d don't normally go out much. Because I spend pretty much most of my time at home when I'm not working. How old are you? 26. And what made you decide to be in this show, Love on the Spectrum? Well, it's because I like to meet a woman and eventually settle down. But I always had trouble doing so because I got nobody to spend time with most of the time. I'll explain how I was discovered by um, Northern Pictures. I'm with a, a company called At Work Australia. They help people with disabilities look for employment, build up their resume, improve on their interview skills, all those things. I, I spoke to my cast manager one day early last year. I mentioned that I'd like to get out there and meet new people. And when Northern Pictures contacted At Work Australia for any potential candidates, they recommended me. And then what happened? Um, they gave me a, a brief interview over the phone, which I was cool with. And um, Did they ask personal questions? I think they did, but I... Don't quite remember what they asked me, but I explained to me what explained to them what I'm like as a person and that I like to be with a woman eventually. Mm. Do you remember the first time you had a crush on a girl? Yes, I did. That was ten years ago. But she didn't reciprocate the feelings. Mm. Who was she? I'll, exp I'll only mention that her first name is Rhiannon. But because feelings weren't reciprocated, I did learn one thing. Never fall for a girl just because she's hot. Yeah, it can be hard though, can't it? Yeah. Was she hot, Rhiannon? Well, in appearance she was. Mm. But my dad did explain to me something once. The reason why I had this crush is because God gave me a glimpse of what it's like to fall in love. And the way I interpret it, that kind of also seems like seemed like a bit of a foreshadow. In what way? That I would eventually meet somebody who will eventually want to go out with me. And so things didn't work out with Rhiannon? No, it didn't. In fact, we were just friends. It never went beyond that. Not at all. Did you go to a school with girls? Yep. And what did you learn about girls being at school with them? <sighs> okay. What I'm going to say is very blunt. Go for it. All I know is a lot of high school girls are very immature and they can be quite shallow as well. Mm. And, and whenever they had a boyfriend, I noticed something about them. Whenever they had a boyfriend, they, they start acting like as if they've just returned from a four-week honeymoon in Paris. In what way, do you reckon? I'll explain. It, become, they, it becomes the sole focus of their attention to the point that it practically becomes an obsession. Mm. And then she, she starts sighing in a dreamlike state mm. or even starts boasting about it to her circle of friends. But unfortunately, there's only one thing that this girl is not, that these girls are unaware of. It's only a matter of time before the relationship fails and then her happiness dies along with it. Then afterwards, she sinks into a deep depression, Poss possibly that, possibly th even thinking that her life is over, until finally she has no choice but to accept that's reality and move on. Mm. Just because you have a boyfriend or, or a girlfriend, that doesn't make them part of your family, unless, unless you're intending to marry each other. Because then that could be the start of accepting that person to your family. Mm. And that doesn't happen at high school. Because those relationships, I mean, four weeks is quite a long time in high school to be with someone, isn't it? Yeah. Did you have lots of girls who were friends when yeah. you were at school? Yes, I did. And I'm, I was quite popular at, at, 
at Wollongong High. That's the school I went to. But I was also quite a very unique type of person there. How so? I, let's just put it this way. My brother once called me this in high school. He once called me the school grump. That's a bit harsh, Michael. I actually, I actually liked liked that that term. You thought it was a good thing. Yeah, because you liked it being the school grump. Yeah, because I was actually the grumpiest person in high school. What made you grumpy? I just hated school because the the students were irritating nonstop, mm. and there was a lot of um, paperwork to to be done. And me and paperwork just don't mix. Michael, you're on a show called Love on the Spectrum. Yes. Obviously, that suggests that you are on the spectrum. What does that mean? What I mean is that um, I actually have Asperger's. Asperger's is a mild form of autism. It's just something that I was born with. But I don't see it as a disability. It's just something to be proud of. When did you first hear the word Asperger's? When I was when I was in primary school, I was completely unaware that I had it. Sorry, but then next year in two thousand and seven, the year I started high school, my mother finally revealed to me that I that I had it. But the reason why she decided to wait until then is because she knew that I wouldn't understand what Asperger's meant. It's quite a hard thing to understand, isn't it? For some people, it is. How was it explained to you? Well, if you want, you can ask my mother. She's right here. Here's one we prepared earlier. <laughs> Vanessa. Yeah, hi. I heard you laughing along there. <laughs> it's the way he puts it. It's He's got away with words, your son. <laughs> yeah. It's so mm, it's so accurate, but the way yeah. it's the way he puts it. <laughs> and um you know, uh, it it's he says it in such a way where you, you've got to say, well, yeah, it kind of is true what yeah. you're saying about girls and boys and relationships, but it's just the way he puts it that makes it funny. <laughs> One of the most um, beautiful things about the series, I mean, there were so many, but watching your family interact with each other, you've got a great family, Michael, such a Thanks. great family. And I loved how you l- took such delight in, in Michael's take on life is he your youngest you've got no eldest he's your eldest so you had nothing to compare him to when he was a little kid no I had no idea what was right what wasn't I knew something was wrong but it was how did you know what did you say um it was um the preschool oh no it was even before he went to preschool because he wasn't speaking so um and I thought that that wasn't right but I thought oh you know maybe he's just a late talker that does happen um and then because I had nothing to compare him from and it was just me and him playing through the day um I I couldn't put my finger on it I did take him to the doctor the doctor said you're just over wearing you're an over wearing mother and I thought oh okay fair enough besides the not talking so much what else did you notice when he was little um it was more the it was just more the the non communication, um, but probably we formed our own way of communicating, um, where it was um, um, through animation and and it just became normal then for us it became normal and he was just a kid you know yeah. so when you say animation you you've got a big <clears throat> smile on your face Michael yeah. what it, what what's your memories of that how did that work well let's just put it this way in 1997. A certain British children's show, I developed a passion for that show. And what was it? Thomas the Tank Engine. Oh, yeah. I've loved that show for a long time. And even when I was growing up, I found it very hard to grow to grow out of it because my passion for it is too deep too and too powerful. And What did just, you love about it? Everything about it. I just loved the concept of railways and steam engines. I've actually been studying the show for years. Do you still watch it sometimes? Yes. And do you collect the trains? Certain ones. Uh-huh. I only collect characters that are from England or Germany or Italy because they're the um they're the cultures that I'm the biggest fans of. So Vanessa, he went to kindy or went to preschool. Preschool, yeah. 
And then what happened? And um, they did point out that there were some differences and that I should get him checked out. And we did discover that he had gluey and they did point out that he wasn't speaking. So um, I just thought, oh, well, it must just be because of the gluey because the doctor said, you know, like he was very frustrated. So that's when your ears are blocked and you can't hear very well. That's right. And he was getting a lot of ear infections. So Mm. um, the, the, the specialist said that he thought he... You know, he saw Michael's behaviour and went, oh, you know, this is frustration, this is upset, he's constantly having ear infections, this is not good. You'll find that once he's got the grommets in, he'll be talking again, he'll be fine, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I was I was hoping that that would just be it. But the, the preschool seemed to think, no, I think you need to look into this a bit further. And, um, you know, in the end, it it turned out that, well, we did go to a childhood psychiatrist and um, he said that he didn't know for sure if it was. He said if he is, he's very high functioning. Mm. um, This was 23 years ago. Yeah, that's right. Mm. And time will tell. So um, then I could see by the time he had to go to school, I could see that he wasn't quite right for school when I compared him against other children. But then also, if it was autism, I was just never going to put him in the school for autism. Full stop, end of story. It just wasn't even a discussion. Because Why is in, that? in my mind, if I was to put Michael in a school for autism, I believe we are opening the door to reinforcing autistic behaviours and I wanted to break those. And what were me, some of those behaviours that you noticed that you were keen um, to break? Okay, some of the obsessions. Um, so, you know, becoming very um, obsessed with um, his strong likes, which, um, you know, and it's okay to have that, but so long as we can bring that back a bit and not have it as strong. Um, so I was kids are often like obsessed with Thomas the Tank or yes. Paw Patrol or the Wiggles yeah. or whatever it happened to be. What were some of the other things that you got really into as a kid, Michael? Well, I got into Disney as well. They just do the best animation. Yeah, yeah they do. So you liked anim- watching animated yeah. movies and stuff. But for people with autism, they see the world in an animated way. Yeah. They don't see what you and I are seeing. They see animation. Really? Explain that to me, Michael. I actually have no way to explain it. I suppose you don't have anything to compare it to because it's just how you see the world. Not really. How did you become aware of this, Vanessa? Because I saw that in his behaviour. So he was very animated. And so I, I thought, okay, I made that correlation and thought, well, he must be seeing the world this way. This is why he is this way. We don't see the world that way. And when we look yeah. at each other, we're not seeing an animated person. He is seeing what what he is seeing. We filter what we see. He doesn't filter what he sees. So that's why it becomes a um, very sensory experience, his whole being. Every sound, every visualisation, every move that you make, for him that's animated mm. Yeah, that whole movie is very animated, even the way he sees colours. So can the world feel a bit too loud sometimes and a bit too much? Yes. Um, Places like Melbourne and Sydney, I actually dislike being in those areas because I absolutely hate loud noises, including applause and chants. Yeah, chants I'm not a fan of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And big, like lots of traffic noises, like loud things. And I much prefer to be in nature Mm. because... Ever since I was a kid, I developed a passion and love for nature and animals. Why do you think that is? What do you love about animals and nature? <sighs> Everything about it. Um, as I was grow- growing up, my dad expla- explained a lot of it to me. All of it had one thing in common. They're all things created by God, which my father and I referred to as our loving creator. And Vanessa... Was the decision to send him to a mainstream school proven to be the right one? Yes, it was. It was a. It was a hard slog. I wouldn't do it any differently because mm. I think it's shaped in, into who he is right now. Um, he's certainly, 
you know, I guess there was a stage when he was becoming a teenager where I thought, oh, let's see what kind of social networking groups I could find for him, which there were none. Um, but there was, well, there was one small group. But, and I think that if Michael was raised from young with these kids, it would have been different. But introducing him to this after he'd been in a mainstream school um, just didn't work out. But I was with a group with um, a, a group of children with varying disabilities and Michael just looked at me and whispered, what are we doing here? And I said, right, that's it, let's go. What's your memory <laughs> of that, Michael? What did you think? I don't remember that. Yeah, really? No. You were little. Yeah. Yeah. He was about 12, 13 and, um, yeah, it didn't work out. That's because he was raised. Mm. He, he was brought up with just neurotypical people. So, um, yeah, so that's why it's been a hard slog for him but he certainly does um, affiliate more with neurotypical people. He doesn't identify with non-neurotypical as much. Yeah. Um, he sees that they aren't, um, they may be Asperger's and he sees that. But then what he'll do is he'll compare himself, go, oh, I'm not as bad as him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So do you prefer being with neurotypical people rather than yeah. neuroatypical people? Yeah. Do you find that it's harder to be accepted by neurotypical people? Um, not really. I never really had any trouble with that. Did you, was there a certain point where you realised, I think I see the world a bit differently to a lot of other people? Maybe when I was, I was still going through high school because as I was lit, finishing high school and going, and going into my 20s, I started to look at the world more realistically and I be, increasingly became more aware of things. What, what kind of things? Like what's happening in the world, what's going on around me, those things. Did a lot of your friends start having girlfriends and boyfriends in high school? A few of them did, yes. And did you wish you could be that as well? Yes, I did. But the thing is, until I was 17, I wasn't allowed to have one because my parents would, knew there would be a distraction for my studies. We can't have that. No. Nah. Actually, none of our kids were allowed to. It wasn't just you. No. It was only, it's, and it's only because I feel like at that age they're emotionally not atur- mature enough. Not yeah, but what about hormones, Vanessa? They'll wait. The heart wants what the heart wants. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> and so do the pants sometimes. <laughs> yes. They'll so get it one day. <laughs> How many kids have you got? Three. How old are they? Um, there's 26, 23 and 21. And so what's your relationship like with your siblings? Actually, it's just I treat them with a lot of love, respect and dignity, but I'm not really close to either of them. In what way? Like what, what, what's not close about your relationship? Um, they don't share any of my passions and they're um, very different for me. They have, they have different viewpoints as well. I've, there's some funny scenes in the show between you and your brother. I can't remember if you're giving him romantic advice or he's giving you dating advice. Actually, it was him that was giving me advice. Can you tell that story for people who might not have seen that episode? Sure. My brother was just giving me some dating advice, which I don't have on me at the moment. It's because he's been in and out of relationships numerous times when he was in high school. But he's got a partner that he's eventually going to settle with. And um, my brother knows a lot about that stuff because, you see... Back when he was a teenager, he was a bit of a Casanova, per se. Really? Yeah. But but with me, I was the kind of person that 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 knew that, that if I tried to be like that, women would just see me as a creep. You think so? Yeah, because, because women are very delicate people mm. who require a lot of respect. In fact, I've actually been trying to remind women that, that for years. You think some women don't respect themselves, right? <sighs> that could be a link as well, is because, you see, I actually find the lack of respect a lot of women get from men very appalling and hard to see, and not to mention here. Mm. When you think of, you know, your ideal partner, who do you think of? Basically somebody who comes from a good family with, with old school values, has a good heart, does not go around doing the wrong thing, breaking the law and taking drugs and doing all that crap. Um, Don't want that. 
somebody that um, is is hardworking, takes takes her responsibility seriously, and and somebody who's very intelligent because intelligence is a a quality that I'm, that I'm very attracted to in women. Hmm. What was the process of doing the show like? There was the, the the girl that you met first and went on a date with. I think you were matched with her. Yeah. How'd that go? The first one was actually the Headlands Hotel in Austin, Mir. Um, that date was, was lovely but not amazing. She just wasn't for me. How can you tell? It's because I just didn't feel anything. Yeah. Like you did for Rhiannon in high school. Yeah. Were there girls after Rhiannon that you had crushes on or that you tried to date? No. None. Because most of them had boyfriends. Mm. And because I don't waste my time pursuing women that have boyfriends. How do you prepare for a date before you, you go out? Mo- I would mostly um, get day advice from my, from my brother or dad, either one. And then... Um, that's all I can think of. What about your sister and your mum? They can give you some insights into women. Yes, they, they could as well. Yep. It's because of all the people in my family, the one I'm really close close to is my dad. Really? Yep. What do you think it is about you two? Me and my dad? Yeah. Well, my dad and I are both very spiritual people. He introduced me to spirituality after I finished school. Where are some of the places that you can meet girls, do you think? I honestly have no clue about that either. Are you on the apps? The dating apps? Only one. Which one? It's called Bumble, but I feel like I'm wasting my time. Why? Because I'm not getting anywhere with anyone. Mm. Must be frustrating. It is. In fact, I was on a, a, on a dating website two years ago on eHarmony, and that was a waste of my, both my time and my money. 240 bucks down the drain. Do you, like, what's the process of going onto these apps and then communicating with people? I haven't been on one. How does it work? I would have to um, put in my email address and set up a password and make up a profile of myself and then just click on which p- people I like I'm interested in and which I'm not interested in. And what do you say in your profile? Basically, I just describe myself as a person. It's a good description. And what your interests are and yeah. who you want to meet. Mm. So... Have you had any, like, interesting dates? Not so far. There's one that was shown on the show where she became a bit anxious and she had to go home and that must have been really tough for both of you. Well, for her it was, but for me it was a bit of a disappointment. But... The thing is, this she that person, that girl and I are different from each other. She lives in Campbelltown for a start, which is too far away, and she's not into formal things. I'm a very refined, formal gentleman. You really are, Michael. You're wearing, like, a beautiful suit with a tie and a – is that a tie clip? Yep. And a pocket square? Yep. You really dressed up. I really appreciate how much you dressed up for today. Did you put a lot of thought into your outfit? Actually – that's what I was. I was. I was already planning to wear these clothes anyway. In fact, I I barely get an opportunity to wear clothes like this. Much to you my frustration. To you like to get dressed up. Yep. After many years growing up watching a father wear the same clothes to work every day, it grows on you. Does he wear a suit to work? He does. And you he, want to be like him? Yeah. My all I can say about my dad is he's a really great man. <laughs> he's he's full of wisdom, and he has given me a lot of guidance over He's a the great years. role model to you, right? He is. Can you imagine living out of home one day? Yes, I can, but not very far away. No. What would it take, Vanessa, to, to have Michael living independently? Is that the aim? Yeah, it is the aim, um, and he's working towards it. He's working towards buying his first home. Um, wow. That's, yeah. That's in the horizon. You must be a good saver, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. That's because I spent a lot of my time listening to my both my parents, my dad in particular. Yeah. Did you ever go through a rebellious phase? You sound like the perfect son. You think your parents are both awesome. Yeah, they are awesome, but I'm not perfect, though. Were you ever naughty? You can ask my mother that question. <laughs> Vanessa, was he <laughs> yes. ever naughty? Yes, he's had his moments. What did he do that was naughty? <laughs> I think the one that comes to mind is... 
in kindergarten. You know how there comes that stage where everybody realises, oh, so I'm not just going to go here for a couple of days and the novelty wears off and then I can keep staying home. I've got to do this every day. So one day he didn't want to go to school. He got my keys and he hit them. And I was looking for them everywhere, everywhere. I was looking for them outside of the house, in the garden. This was midday and I'm going, I can't take this kid to school. In the end, he went and got them. He hid them in the lounge, down down the side of the lounge where the arm is. He hid them in there. I was never going to find them there. Do you remember that, Michael? No, I don't. (laughs) That's only kindergarten, but I'm like, you crafty devil. (laughs) That was that was twenty years ago. Yeah. Is that the only naughty thing you've ever done? That's pretty impressive. Um. Oh no, he's he has he has had his mischievous times, but mostly he can just give some attitude. Yeah. Um. Do you worry about him sometimes, Vanessa? Like, was there was there a time after his diagnosis where did it come as a relief, or it made you concerned for his future? Ah, oh, there was always concern. Um, and always concerned because there were a lot of behaviours that I could see needed to be modified. I didn't think that you would ever be able to... It's not something that you can fix, it's there, but I think that as much as you can normalise someone, I feel for us, and everyone's going to have their own view, and with total respect to anybody with a child with autism, every parent have to has to handle it their way. But for us, the way I see it, we live in a society with neurotypical people. Mm. And if you want to one day leave this earth and know that they can stand on their own two feet, I knew that to do that, I had to normalise him as much as possible, which means make him not just physically but emotionally independent. So, you know, people just think physical independence and that's great. But your emotional independence... Can you explain what you mean by emotional independence? Um, the ability to think for yourself and not just copy what somebody else is saying, which is what he used to do. Not think for yourself, which if you'd say this table is pink, he'd go, yep, it's pink. Is it pink? And mm. this is how we started out. So it was the ability to think for himself, to have his own views, form his own views not just take what somebody else says and say, well, then that's it. No. So it was teaching him how to do that. It was teaching him how to self-soothe when he's upset. It's teaching him that if he can't self-soothe, what can I do? What are my resources? Because the last thing you want are siblings that feel that they have a burden. Mm. That's not good for them, nor is it good for Mike. Can you think, Michael, of ways that you're now more emotionally and physically independent than you used to be? Going on dates, I imagine, by yourself. Yes. That's pretty independent. I wouldn't wouldn't bring somebody to watch me, no. Except a TV crew when you're making the show. Uh, That's a bit of a different story. It sure is. Have you had any dates since then? Nope. But you're hoping to again? Yes. What do you think you'll do if you don't find someone? I wouldn't know what to do because I'm not keen on, on, on being... I, don't, I can't embrace the idea of being single my entire life because to me, that's unfulfillment. Mm. And, and no, that means no purpose in life. You know, it's funny. When we talk to girls, we try to say to them, a man won't fulfill you, like a man won't complete you. And you have to be complete yourself before you find a partner. Do you ever think that you have to like not look at someone to complete you or do you genuinely feel like you're incomplete until you find someone to be with? I don't really feel incomplete. I um, just feel like there's a part of the puzzle missing. Mm. That connection and that companionship. Yes. What do you imagine it would be like if you found someone? What would you do together? We would do anything we wanted to do together. Dance together, go to the, go to the cinemas, take, take her out to dinner, um, go over seas together when we're able to again. Imagine that. Yeah. Can you imagine being with, and when you think about yourself with this um, hypothetical partner, do you imagine that it's someone 
neurotypical or neuroatypical, or do you don't mind? Um, neurotypical. Sounds like you're a little bit prejudiced against people who are neuroatypical. Are you? No, definitely not. It's just not. What is it about them that's just not your jam? Nothing about them. It's just that. He just, has some Aspie friends. Yeah, I yeah. do. Yep. Yeah. Two of them, actually. And then those two are my closest male friends because they're the ones I have the most common ground with. People with people that are that are atypical, I'm happy to be friends with them, mm. no question, no doubt. But when it comes to a relationship, a marriage, I see myself with somebody who's neurotypical. Do you think that's because they'll be more independent? Um, I guess you can say that. Because mm, in the show they were matching you with people who were who were atypical, weren't they? Yeah, so sort of yeah. And what about the the coaching that you got from that woman? Was yeah. that helpful? What did she yeah. tell you to do and not to do? Well, she basically just taught, t- taught instructed me that in order for a relationship to start, it has to start with a friendship, which in most cases it does. That did, that was mostly helpful and. Um, we also have um, monthly catch-ups on, on Skype. Oh, do you? Still? Yeah. We just decided to start doing it. Okay, so here's your pitch. You've got lots of women who are listening to this. Yes. I'll hand over the mic to you. Okay. What would you like to tell them? I would like to say one thing to them. If any fine, fine lady in her 20s is willing to go out with... With a refined, romantic, loyal gentleman such as myself, and and make and give yourself the best time. You know, the, I mean, um, have the best time of your life. I can definitely make that happen. And if any any if any women in their in in their twenties is interested, you'll have to contact this email address. Lots at northernpictures.com.au. Lots at northernpictures.com.au. We'll definitely put a link in our show notes. Excellent. Michael, I hope you find what you're looking for. She'll be a very lucky lady. You would not believe how many people have told me that. I just want to ask you one more question. Sure. What do you think women are looking for? Well, all I can say is women like to look for a man that will be able to take care of them and themselves and most... In other words, be a hard worker at their job and be the loving husband that will come home to them every evening and be and will be a great father to their kids. What's the most confusing thing about women? For me, there's um, quite a few things. Well, firstly, I can say that what goes on in a woman's in a woman's head, I don't always understand, but what goes on in a woman's heart will never disappoint me. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. In fact, I actually made a, a philosophy on women's beauty. Please share it. Sure. There are many things in this world that highlight the features of a woman's exterior. Fashion, clothes, hair, makeup, shoes, jewelry, cosmetics, glasses. That's, that's a good one. Um, and many other things like that. But none of those things matter. Not even a little. If a if a man wants to look for true beauty in a woman, the only place he'll find it is in her heart because that's where her her true beauty lies. The, 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 summarize, the summarize way is that a woman's true beauty is not judged by how she appears, but, but, but by what lies within her heart and soul. And do you think the same goes for you? Yeah. About your beauty and what makes you attractive? Yes, that yeah. applies to everyone. You got a big heart, right? Yeah. I'm basically a teddy bear. He is. <laughs> Vanessa, does your heart um, go into your mouth every time he goes out on dates or when he's interested in someone? You seem very relaxed about it. I am because, you know, whatever will be, will be. Um, I, I, I can't sit there and go, oh, I hope, I hope. I, I can't do that because, you know, um, the one thing I have learned with Michael is that he is such an expert at body, body language, comes back to, 
you know, all the animation, all of that. He's he's learned how to read people so well that this much of a change in my behaviour, and he picks up on it straight away. And he mm. won't come and ask me. He'll just come in a roundabout way and go, things okay, Mum? Yeah, everything's great. Are you sure? Perfect. Is it really that perfect, Mum? You know? So What do you notice, is- Michael? If a woman is um, behaving in a in a way that you wouldn't expect, in other words, she's not feeling if she's if she's feeling down, but she's trying her best to hide it and act like she's all all cool. I would say to her, I I hear that you're that you're okay, but why do I get the impression that secretly you're not? You're very perceptive, and that's interesting because some people think that people who have autism are not in tune emotionally and are not good at reading signals. But that, along with all the eye contact that you make, they're too, you know, I suppose it's called a spectrum for a reason. Yeah. Because you are extraordinary with eye contact. You've got beautiful eyes and you look very directly. But he, he for a long time, wasn't that way. And so at the, and that goes back to what I was thinking when he was young. I wasn't prepared to just accept what I had. I needed to work with it. Because you never know what you can get out of it. Mm. You never know how somebody can flourish and transform. So eye contact is learned behaviour. Do you, do you have oh, to yeah. still force yourself to do that, Michael, or it comes naturally now? Yeah, um, a bit of both, actually, because my eyes do tend to wander sometimes. But that's just. But that's not because I'm disinterested. That's just a uh, habit that I've always had. Yeah, I think a lot of people do that. That's because to you and I, we can filter. Uh, so I can filter everything here, both both visually and in audio, and just look at you and listen to you. But with Michael, Michael cannot filter what he's seeing. He's seeing you and he's seeing everything mm-hmm. else. He's hearing you, but he's also hearing that hum in the background, uh, uh, something in the air con. He's, he's hearing everything that down to the most smallest hum. Yeah. It is. By the end of the day, he can be exhausted. Mm, I can. What do you do to relax? My idea of relaxing is I spend my my time in my my bedroom. I call it my quarters. And I use it to do (laughs) either acting, which is my passion, and watching television. What are your favourite shows? There's a few, actually. SpongeBob is one of them. It's pretty funny. Rick and Morty. Very funny. Um, Modern Family. Yeah. Gilligan's Island. I love that since I was 13. So good. An oldie but a goodie, Gilligan's yeah. Island. It's <laughs> yeah. a real classic. In fact, the Skip is my favourite character in that show. The Skipper? Mm, I like Ginger. Ginger's a princess. <laughs> she is. Maybe that's why I like her. <laughs> and in fact... Is Marianne more your type? Yeah. Yeah, and I because you'd say and that. because <laughs> And because Marianne is not in love with herself. No, Ginger's very vain. Exactly. Mm. Uh, any woman who's vain... This is how I describe it. If you wear a dress and your and your reflection is your true love, you're a princess. No princesses <laughs> for you. Princesses need not apply. No. Right? Because unfortunately, I don't have time for, for, for things that are too much work. So you want someone who's not too high maintenance. Exactly. Somebody who's able to take, take some of the weight on their shoulders too. Mm. But I wouldn't leave all the work to her. I would do my share as well. Of course you would. Yes. Where have you learnt about relationships from? I've learned about it from my dad, from my brother, from my mother, and a bit from my sister and a few other things along the way. Fantastic. Michael, I wish you so much luck and love. Um, it's been beautiful to see your journey. Thanks. And I can't wait for season two. Us too.